let's let's wait for 30 viewers to to, to, to tune on. Hello. Very good evening to everyone. Just give us a second while we whilst we wait for the viewers to tune on. Okay, we can begin now. A very good evening to all members of the public. My name is Charles. I am a CEC member. I'm also a prospective candidate. I will be hosting the first, the second ever video outreach of today. At the outset, I would um, actually like to outline the method by which I will be inviting questions from the members of the public later, which would be for the members of the public to type their questions in the comment section of the Facebook Live video. And thereafter, we will answer the questions in turn. I would now like to call upon the Secretary General, Mr. Kenneth Jiranan, to say a few words. Mr. Kenneth, please. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, a very a good evening to you, my fellow Singaporeans, uh, supporters, and well wishers who have logged on this evening to listen to our second. Uh, live uh, broadcast and streaming video. We welcome you to ask uh, questions at the end of this. Um, let me just say that uh, this, these are unprecedented times. Um, we are forced to this somewhat unusual format, mainly because, uh, as everyone knows, we are in the midst of probably the greatest crisis since uh, World War II uh, for humanity, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, we feel that uh, the government is taking advantage of the <coughs> pandemic to hold a snap election uh, when uh, the opposition are particularly restricted. We can't hold physical rallies. Uh, we are restricted to groups of five and social distancing measures when we visit. And uh, obviously there are far fewer people around to meet us in any case. So the government is using this <clears throat> opportunity to try and um, gain an even more unfair advantage, an even more unequal playing field than they normally have. And they're trying to get an even greater landslide than they got in 2015. So that's something that we rely upon you to stop. Now, I know that um, probably the majority of your questions will be directed at what um, at the possibility of three cornered fights and particularly to the one that the government's the state media have been um, stoking uh, in between Reform Party and Dr. Tan Chen Wok's Progress Singapore Party 
in West Coast GRC. Let me say straight off that there is no conflict. The government media are using this as a, what we call in politics a dead cat distraction. A dead cat distraction is when you want to focus the public's attention away from your own problems or your own difficulties and put it onto someone else by bringing up uh, another matter that is irrelevant. What we should be focusing on is the government's track record in handling this pandemic. They have been flip-flopping from one policy to another. They have given inadequate help to Singaporeans. Despite the talk of 92 billion, which has been flung around carelessly by uh, Finance Minister Heng Sui Kiat and uh, Ms. Tin Pei Ling, I find no evidence that they have spent 92 billion. In fact, the amount that they have really spent on helping Singaporeans amounts to about $2.5 billion, which on a per capita basis works out to $600. So don't be distracted. Let me tell you that we enjoy friendly, we have had many hours of constructive discussions with Progress Singapore Party. The government media want to paint the opposition as disunited and engaging in three cornered fights. But the reality is that we are actually pretty united. Many of us, most of us agree on the core agenda that we need democratic accountability and greater checks and balances in Parliament. Back to uh, Progress Singapore Party and Reform Party, uh, we have had many hours of cordial talks. We are still in discussions and we hope to reach an agreement soon. That is really all I can tell you at the moment. However, I can reveal that uh, our SMC lineup, we will be contesting Kebun Baru, Yochu Kang, and Radin Mass in the upcoming election. And we hope to be able to reveal to you what GRCs we will be contesting soon. So thank you very much for listening. And I'll hand the mic back to Charles now. All right. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Kenneth, at this, uh, thank you, Kenneth, for delivering your important announcement. That is most really, it's very important that all members of the public take note of what uh, Kenneth has said, and they may wish to really uh, rewind or review the video to, to take note about that. But anyway, guys, at this segment, at this point in time, I would uh, like to deliver my own speech on why you should vote for me. Members of the public, the reason why I ask for your vote and for your support is because I believe ardently in the values of democratic accountability and transparency. The PAP is around, today we see that the, the situation, the PAP per, uh, would always declare Singapore to be a democracy, but Singapore is 158 in the world ranking for press freedom. It is only a few ranks or notches above North Korea and Iran, and it is not far away from Sudan or Libya. The idea is that in Singapore, we have the facade of a meritocracy and democratic accountability, and these two things work inter, uh, intertwined. But anyway, I just want to introduce myself first of all, which is that by profession, I, I am a lawyer. I am 30 years of age. I studied, in terms of the academic pedigree that 
that uh, Singaporeans are conditioned to judge a person by. I did well in school, specifically I obtained eight points at the, uh, before any discount at the O-levels for the three points at the International Baccalaureate. And I obtained a second offer from a university ranked top 10 in the UK from in my year of matriculation. Now, the reason why I gave this biodata is really to poke fun at the PAP's way of introducing their candidate. The fact of the matter is that you have to, I'm asking and appealing for your vote because, not because I, you should not vote for me because of my personal credentials. You should not vote for me because you feel I'm able to speak well. These are the traits of elitist thinking, which is contrary to the constitution of the Reform Party, which the quoted philosophy verbatim is that every member of the society is born with fundamental rights which cannot be abrogated, and that it is the paramount dignity of the society to uphold the inherent human dignity of its every single member. The key phrases we can note are, first of all, fundamental rights, secondly, paramount duty, and thirdly, human dignity. Fundamental rights in itself suggests that there are rights that cannot be abrogated. And at the end of the day, the I want, I hope that members of the public viewing this video will consider voting for me at the end of the day as someone who summarily rejects the vision of the PAB for a hierarchical and tiered society, where which has in the wake of the pandemic, it has highlighted this concern has be, become even more real. For example, in the, the it, it has become even more real. And the reason why the migrant workers were ignored entirely is really because you know, they were invisible and at the lowest tier of the hierarchy proposed at the PA. But at the end of the day, I hope that you guys will vote for me on the basis that I am able to to, if you if you feel that you know you need an alternative voice in parliament, you you want a, an individual who believes that that um, the the that that the beliefs of the BAB that uh, you know uh, society should be run by persons from the upper class who are Chinese educated males from the elite schools and doctors, lawyers, corporatists, and all these individuals and elite civil servants, which is even more ludicrous. I, and if you do not want all these persons and instead you want a, a, an individual who believes and is willing to come forward and put aside all his uh, personal privilege to run under the banner of the Reform Party and suffer the same tribulations that J. Ratnam suffered, then please vote for me. Thank you. Okay, guys, and we are going to, at this juncture, I would uh, pass the mic back to Kenneth to ask if he has anything else to add before I begin to admit the question. No, uh, Charles, I really um, don't have much to add. Um, I think that was, um, you know, a very succinct uh, introduction and uh, the reasons why, um, you sh voters should be voting for you. Um, shall we uh, pass to the Q&A session now? Uh, we probably have someone else coming, uh, uh, one of our other prospective candidates coming in later, but um, they're not here at the moment. So I'll pass back to you, Charles. Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, guys, at the moment, there is, it's still early days. As you guys know, it has only been 15 minutes since we began the stream. And just wanted to share with you guys that there are no questions at the moment, but there is uh, a lot of messages of uh, support and there are no hateful messages at all. And in fact, um, there are, to read out verbatim, we will support you if you don't, don't contest a three corner fight from Mr. Zaidi Nuru. And there is another message from Mr. Vinod Patron, which is that any other SMC or GRC will be in your best interest. I'm just reading out uh, comments, fulfilling my duty as a moderator by reading out, uh, you know, interactions from the members of the public. I also seek the cooperation of all members of the public to 
publicize the stream because of the very important nature of what is, uh, you know, we just, we believe in the values of democratic discourse. We need your participation. It is not about me. It is not about Kenneth. It is not about the Reform Party. It is, we are not authoritarian. We want to hear your views and we really, we will answer them according to the party's manifesto to the best of our ability. And we have an SOP to, to you know, answer the questions. And we, but at the end of the day, we need to hear, we need to, to hear your questions and your input. All right, guys, what questions do you all have? Charles, yeah. uh, while we are waiting for the questions to come in, I will just um, remind uh, everybody watching of um, what Dr. Tan actually said yesterday. And his words were, no one can force, can tell another party <coughs> where they can stand. So I'd just like to remind everybody of that. But as I said before, our discussions continue and uh, they're very cordial. We are very close to an agreement and we hope to be make an announcement shortly. Thank you. Back to you, Charles. Yes, uh, Kenneth, the first question is really from Mr. Dean Baremboy, which is, do you believe having a three corner fight will help Singaporeans? Charles, I think I've answered that question. Yes. So, uh, uh, so um, I don't know. I'll pass it back to you if you have anything to add. All right. Um, I think, uh, guys, Kenneth has really answered this question in detail. And I, I will really, uh, on this matter, guys, my, my own personal view is that, you know, we, at the end of the day, in fact, Dr. Tan and Kenneth have both made this, if with reference to what Dr. Tan said, who is, you know, we can't disagree with his comment that, that every, in a democratic society, the principle of democracy is that each and every candidate has the right to, to come forward to, to contest. You know, and it is for you, the electorate, to decide which brand of opposition or who is the legitimate opposition in that context. It is an open question. It's not for me to dictate. It is, that is for, it is for you, members of the party, to decide and to make the necessary inferences and also to feedback your views to the, the Reform Party. And at the moment, uh, there is still... Charles, should I just um, step in and make some closing remarks about uh, follow-up on that, uh, the points you raised on that question? I just wanted to say also that um, for those who might just be joining us now, uh, this is something that um, the mainstream or state media, uh, because all media in Singapore is ultimately government owned and controlled, with many of the um, chief executives, which the government has a right to appoint, many of them coming directly from the ISD, like uh, the ex-president S.R. Nathan, who was formerly with ISD before heading Straits Times. Um, I would like to say that um, they try to distract from the government's own shortcomings, from the fact that um, Li Xian Lung owes everything to his dad and um, would not be in that position without um, who his father was. Uh, from the government's uh, poor record in dealing with the pandemic, with the issues of accountability and the fact that a small elite seemed to monopolize all the economic rewards in Singapore. Uh, they try to create, to, to distract from that, they try to create an impression of um, opposition disunity and squabbling. And I've said that that actually is, nothing could really be further from the truth. 
uh, there is substantial agreement among the parties over manifestos and agenda. Uh, for instance, um, in 2015, we announced that we would be, uh, if we were in government, we would seek we would pay senior citizens over 65s a senior's pension of $500 a month. And we would also pay child benefit of $300 per month per child. And we are very pleased that SDP have adopted that policy. The day, we need to hear. Sorry, uh, Charles, and I, I'll just finish. And, um, SDP have adopted that policy and uh, PSP have also announced that they would pay uh, Singaporeans, I think they said $500 per month, but only after the second, only for the second child onwards. So I think that um, should answer the question that there is opposition unity. So I'll pass it back to you, Charles, and we'll wait for the next question. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. I believe Kenneth has really uh, given a very detailed uh, response to this question, question. So in the meantime, I will not be admitting any, in the interest of fairness, I mean, and comprehensive, the comprehensive answer that Kenneth has given. In fact, I believe you have spent about 24 minutes in total, almost 20 plus minutes to discuss about this topic. So we will be waiting for for further questions. And at the moment, Kenneth, um, there are still no questions. We Shall we continue to, to wait? But the majority of the responses here are, uh, there are at the moment no questions yet. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. I think um, we will just wait for another 30 minutes and see if any more questions come in before uh, wrapping up. Yes. Rem just a reminder to everybody, feel free to ask questions. Uh, we are waiting to take them and hope to, to answer them as fully as possible. Uh, thank you, hold on. Yes. Um, we are currently, um, I'm trying to monitor the stream and ensure that uh, there are no, that it is not interrupted and and kind of at the moment, there are still no questions, but there are a number of positive responses who are greatly heartened by your, by, by, okay, uh, there is one question here. The question from the member of the public is that Ms. Noraini said, RP will promote a child benefit of $300 per month for each child. Where is the money going to come from? This is, uh, thank you, Charles. This is a question that recurs again and again uh, from Singaporeans who seem puzzled by the idea that um, we can afford uh, to provide even the most minimal safety net for our citizens. 
let me say that this is completely false and is a result of years, years and years of PAP indoctrination or um, gaslighting of Singaporeans to convince them that the country cannot afford uh, these basic levels of welfare. Firstly, we have been running, or the government has been running surpluses. That is money that you and I uh, could be spending. Uh, the government has been running surpluses now for decades. Every year, the finance minister presents a budget, which in many respects is completely fraudulent. A lot of the spending that he announces is not real spending at all. In fact, it goes into funds and, and endowments rather than being spent on the people. I can give a concrete example of that. One is the Medeca Generation Fund that Tarman announced with great fanfare in 2014. Headline figure, $8 billion, wow, spending on our senior citizens. Actual reality, uh, about 150 to $200 million a year. To date, the fund still stands at about $7.1 billion, five years after this money was supposed to be being spent on Singaporeans in that budget. In fact, if you look at the reserves that the government has, it's not only uh, a statement of assets and liabilities that the government publish, it has to publish under the constitution every year. This shows that the government has maybe net reserves of 500 billion, but that balance sheet definitely does not include GIC and Tomasic. I suspect that the government has easily another 500 billion to $1 trillion of reserves, which is hidden from Singaporeans. So don't believe them when they say we cannot afford spending. We should be like Norway. <coughs> the Norwegians have a pension fund, which is supposed that is drawn from their oil revenues which is over $1 trillion. And the Norwegians spend around 4% of that fund per annum. Now in Singapore, if we had one to $1.5 trillion of uh, government assets, net of debt, and we spent 4% of that, that would be 40 billion to $60 billion of extra spending that we could afford every year not just now during the pandemic, but every year. That means that we could provide Singaporeans with universal health care. We could take away, replace the MediSave, MediShield and MediFund systems, uh, which uh, are very parsimonious and ad hoc. We could replace it with universal health care, uh, definitely for the over 65s. We could also afford, as I said, to pay an old age pension of $500 a month and a child benefit of $300 per child. Because let's face it, uh, our birth rate, our fertility rate has fallen to uh, just over one. And at that rate, Singaporeans are becoming extinct. So if we don't provide more help to Singaporeans with families, we won't have many, any more Singaporeans being born. So uh, other, benefit, other things that we should be doing for our people, we should have a limited unemployment benefit. We should have, um, we should be providing, um, if we have national service, now reform party thinks that the national service should be broadened to include women and it should, uh, also be extended to new citizens and PRs, or they should pay substantial extra taxes. Uh, we want to reduce national service to uh, less than a year, but also nationals, people who serve national service 
should uh, get free university education, rather as is the case in the US. So when Li Xianlong goes on about the need to raise taxes, as I'm sure they will, because after this spending in the pandemic, uh, Heng Sui Kiat is saying, oh my God, we are out of money. This is unprecedented, our fiscal situation is terrible and he's lying to you. Uh, so he's going to be putting up uh, GST after the election. Once things more or less recover, GST is going to soar, probably beyond 9%, maybe to 12%. Um, so don't be fooled when they say there are no resources available to help the people. And don't be fooled by uh, people who say that we cannot afford even the most basic of social provision, like our child benefit. Firstly, also, I just wanted to mention in relation to child benefit, if more Singaporeans are, are born, that also means more workers to support uh, the, the aging workforce, the, age, the, the pensioners. So uh, a benefit in, in economic terms is, can be easily justified in terms of a cost benefit analysis, in terms of the additional taxes that those extra workers will pay over their lifetimes. Thank you, and uh, back to you, Charles. Thank you for your answer. And this, just to remind all viewers that have tuned in, the format is that uh, Kenneth answer first, and then I will give my, my answers, if any, to the questions that I will try to, and I'll, I'll engage with the substantive matter of the question. But whilst Kenneth was giving his rather lengthy response, which is, regarding the 300 child benefit, I, I actually have something to add. I, I fully agree with Kenneth. And I want to point out that $300, whilst it may be, be difficult to disbelieve the VAB's gaslighting, from my own personal experience, we have to, as a lawyer who has assisted many single mothers to file the MMS summons in the state courts, the reason or the, the just, we, we just have to note that that $300 would be a huge help to them. And at the end of the day, it is paid to the mother on the basis that there is a wealth of scientific research that shows that the maternal instinct, in fact, this would be self-explanatory. The maternal instinct is strong and it is driven to, to we have to look at things in the bigger picture. The PAP would regularly say that, you know, $300 to spend on, for example, if, they talk about this, they will hire PAP IB to leave comments, which I'm not going to ding to respond. And they would, they, in fact, that comment or that question which was asked in, uh, is by an anonymous member of the public, which I, which we still responded because I think as a party, we believe in, in responding to all questions, whether or not they are difficult. But I, I just wanted to point out that if you guys look at the comment section, you can actually see that he had left a very negative comment after that, attacking a person's quality, who said, re, saying that he does not need to impress someone whose highest qualification is NITEC in office skills, and someone who is in his 40s with the ugly hairstyle. So I think, guys, I'm not going to dignify the response further, and, and I'll leave it for you guys to see if you guys as members of the electorate agree with the thinking of the critique. All right. So uh, Kenneth, the next question is that, is that, the next question is that, uh, there are a number of other questions. And the next question is that, how shall we handle the pandemic going forward? It is a rather broad question. So of course, uh, can you share your thoughts? Uh, thank you, Charles. I mean, I am not an expert, I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, so um, I can't really answer questions uh, about um, the disease or the infection rate. Uh, I think um, what we need to bear in mind is uh, the government was initially praised for its handling of the COVID pandemic, but it completely overlooked the situation in the foreign worker dormitories, which 
surely should have been obvious uh, to anybody who had uh, who was a doctor uh, or to the Ministry of Health that this was an accident waiting to happen that with eight or nine workers crowded in a small room sharing with three tier bunks uh, this was an accident waiting to happen like a petri dish uh, for infection to occur uh, going forward I support the the government circuit breaker measures. Uh, I feel that um, the help given to Singaporeans has been inadequate and that we can afford to give much more. And uh, particularly as a lot of the support provided um, will not actually be real spending because it goes from what, like one pocket to another because it supports government owned companies and it supports landlords, the rebate of property tax, and the principal landlord is, of course, our government, which owns 90% of the land in Singapore. Uh, I uh, feel that um, Li Xian Lung is risking all your um, health and even your lives by holding this uh, completely unnecessary election during the middle of a pandemic, um, even though the infection rate is declining, uh, we are still running huge risks. Um, and um, you know, but uh, as long as we um, follow that path of gradually easing restrictions, um, that is the best path to follow. Charles, back to you, please. Yeah. All right. Um, Kenneth, the next question, actually from um, a member of the public is, so my apologies, uh, guys, give me a second whilst I refresh the thread. Uh, a member of the public has actually messaged in to ask, what is the first thing you would work on if elected? The, this is to, for reference, this person's number, the, to read out the number, to prove that this is a legitimate question, it comes from the first four numbers, uh, so that Madam, you may take note of response of the questioner is 9041, yeah. Okay, Kenneth, what is the answer? What is the first thing you would work on if you like? Oh, sorry, Charles. Sorry, finish, repeat the question again. A question from uh, through our messaging has come in, which is expressing support, but asking in the, the question is that, what is the first thing you would work on if elected? Thank you, Charles. Well, I think the priority, obviously, as we will not be forming the government, uh, we will not be able to implement our manifesto what we will be doing is uh, ensuring that this government is properly held to account, which we feel is not being a good job, is not being done at the moment in parliament by the current uh, opposition. Um, what we need to find out is get more clarity on the quantity, what the real reserve situation is, we believe, uh, or I believe that uh, it might be $1.5 trillion of reserves. This should be the real figure. Um, and we need to get clarity on that and then demand uh, why uh, we cannot uh, spend more on this on Singaporeans. We need to remove this uh, archaic restriction on um, distinction between past and present reserves and these restrictions on spending, which to an economist uh, don't really make much sense. Um, as for what else we'll be doing, you can be very sure that um, whether we win an SMC or a GRC, we will be making sure that the town council is run efficiently because you can trust us to do that 
because you can see from the 2015 election that we were very, very careful in how much money we spent. We achieved results that were in line with everyone else and the uh, difficult constituencies that we contested. And yet we spent by far the lowest of any party. And we promise that we will be very careful with your money and ensure that it is not spent unwisely, unnecessarily, on, and we will return any surplus to the residents of the constituency that we were elected to serve. Uh, Charles, I'll pass it back to you for your answer. All right. Um, my answer is that I, I think the government has really overlooked the pandemic and handled the pandemic in a very... Uh, it, we want to be very precise when, and I, perhaps I would like to narrow down, how would I have handled the pandemic better? Of course, we do not propose, I, I think at the end of the day, three critics could be identified of the way the government handled the crisis. First of all, the, the government began off too slack and after that became too, of course at this point, Juncture. I want to state that uh, these are uh, my the, these views would of course may not be the official views of the Reform Party, but I just want to, to put them forward for the consideration of members of the public. First of all, on member a few members of the opposition, including myself posted extensively on social media to earlier in February calling for the wearing of masks and then we were ridiculed. And fast forward to, to the present day, we see that mask wearing has really been a reality. And, and other than that, you know, in fact, one illustration is that, you know, the, the news, the state propagandistic state media ran an article on a paramedic who saved uh, Heng Sui Kiet's life, who is really Li, Xian, Li Xianlong's uh, future understudy. So the way they, they, it was, but it was hilarious because they portrayed her being commissioned with her epaulet being pinned on. And it, it was, the epaulet was, we, we can extrapolate, even though I'm not an epi, epidemiologist. At that point of time, I want to highlight a few points which I think are very important for consideration. First of all, the feedback of many members of the opposition was discounted. The views of the four doctors who wrote in extensively and the, the views of the four doctors that wrote in to ask advocate wearing of masks, this was silence and was even given a summary rebuke by Kenneth Mark, who, whose views are that, you know, he, because from the government point of view, the scholars point of view, they are always right and they are not willing to listen to alternative views. So it is this culture of group thing, the first, the, the, that is the first problem. The second problem is that the migrant workers were invisible because in the tiered society of Singapore, they, they fall at the lowest tier altogether of the Singapore structure as proposed by the, 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 by the PAP. And they were practically invisible because they have no status at all. And, and at the end of the day, that is why the government was drunk on the praise of, the, of some commenters from the international, uh, you know, from the international arena. And thereafter, uh, this, if we look at hard facts, Singapore is now one of the highest in cases in the world. In, in fact, I believe it is the second highest. And we also want to note something, which is that the state media is forever putting forward a lot of propaganda. Like, you know, it would, it would send people to write articles like, uh, in, uh, you can't test if you don't have enough case, if you, you can't have cases if you don't test. But these are lies because I have contacts in Vietnam and they told me that in March, uh, three cheap testing kits were developed. And this has been reported extensively, you know, you know by international health bodies. And they would say that they would go at all costs to portray Singapore as a model of success in dealing with the epidemic, which really is very disappointing. It's, it's very, very disappointing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I do not have any, anything else to add for, for that. And there is, 
Now, a positive message from Mr. Aloysius Wong. Um, should I, I, I think I will now read it out. And the, the positive message from Mr. Aloysius Wong is that, Dear Kenneth, I know many are calling RP to withdraw from West Coast GRC. With due respect, please go with your strategies. You have been engaging the ground since 2011. Like Mr. TCB says, if three-cornered fight is required, let it be. Good luck, RP. The reason why I'm reading out these comments is that I believe in the spirit of democracy, we will read out all comments, positive or negative, and we will allow readers to make the necessary, you know, we don't believe in censorship, we don't believe in profma. And with that, there is a question now, Kenneth, which is uh, from right. a Charles, can I just um, comment on Mr. Aloysius Wong's comment? Uh, yeah. say, to say thank you very much, sir, for your support. Um, I would like just to say that, uh, Bill, I'm glad that uh, you would support us if we entered into a three-cornered fight. Uh, that is not our intention. And, uh, you know, our intention is to be in Parliament to represent you. Thank you. Yeah. At this juncture, there is a question specifically uh, from the member of public whose number begins with eight. Uh, I do not, the, the message is, okay, so the, the message from the member of public to the, to the messaging platform, I'm getting notifications that the messages are coming in through the platform, through, through our private message. So you guys can also ask through that format if your questions are not being displayed. But the question is, is that what is our position on, on POFMA? So, Kenneth, do you want me to answer that? Let me, or maybe I'll answer, answer it first, Charles, okay. and then pass it back to you. Yeah. Um, well, as you know, um, no, as some of you may be aware who read my blog um, at um, kendriaretnam.com, um, I have been a vocal critic of POSMA and pointed out its many contradictions. Shanmugam, the Minister for Law, promised before it was introduced that it would only be used against fake news, extreme uh, fake news. Instead, what we have seen is the government actually using it to silence critics and to frighten ordinary Singaporeans by slapping them with posmas so that they feel that the next stage might be <clears throat> that they will be hauled before the court and given a huge fine. Uh, POSMA at, in, is being used for invalid purposes. For instance, notoriously, Heng Sui Kiat issued a POSMA to people who speculated on the salary of um, the Prime Minister's wife, Ho Ching. Uh, I remember a Taiwanese news station uh, said that um, she earned $99 million per annum. I have consistently said since 2015 that we need to know what she earns and that it could be anything in excess of tens of millions up to hundreds of millions a year. If you look at the, the remuneration of CEOs of similar very large companies uh, or holding companies or hedge funds in the US, the point is that we haven't got any, we'd like to know why Ho Ching was appointed head of Tomasic. So instead of answering these questions and telling us what her salary is, uh, Heng Sui Kiat issued a POSMA, uh, a correction notice requiring those who had speculated on Ho Ching's salary uh, to carry it um, with some ridiculous argument. He answered it without disclosing any facts. There was only the assertion that she's the fifth highest earner in Tomasic not the first, but what does that mean? Does that mean that year? 
Does that mean every year? Does that mean since she took over as 2004? And let's not forget she held it through the financial crisis. She was reappointed when the fund lost 30%. She's, uh, Tomasic's performance has not been good, and yet uh, her position remains unchallenged. As CEO of uh, Tomasic, um, she seems to spend most of her time on Facebook, uh, criticizing and rebutting Singaporeans who criticize her husband. Uh, so what is she really doing for the money? But anyway, that illustrates how POSMA was used uh, to silence those critical of the government. In addition, um, a ordinary Singaporean uh, woman who um, published something about um, the budget and that uh, most of the money was not actually going to Singaporeans, but was actually going to Singaporean uh, GLCs, government linked companies, was also issued with a POSMA. But to date, I, uh, let me say I have never been issued with a POSMA. The government will never issue with me with a POSMA because they know that they would have to answer. They would have to give us reasons and they would have to give us facts and they don't want to do so. They want to keep this quiet. So I think POSMA is a ridiculous law. It should be repealed and uh, it's making a laughing stock of this government. Um, Thank you. And uh, Charles, I'll pass it over to you. All right. Guys, my view on POFMA can actually be extrapolated from the manifesto of the Reform Party, which, which does, is silent, of course, on POFMA as a topic, but we can extrapolate the principles that the Reform Party stands for and reason logically from there. The reason is that POFMA is the modern day IT region in the online context of the government not having to the, the, the test, the legal test being too much in favor of the government. Before I answer the question on POFMA specifically, if, if we consider the, the position that, you know, that, that uh, has been struck in terms of the legal test for other uh, high profile, you know, issues that have long confound, you know, they have, they have, that have been used to persecute the opposition since the time of our founder. We immediately see why POFMA is really not in the public interest. In the time of our, our okay, guys, in the, as many of you will know, and if you do not know, you can simply Google, because today we have Google. Of course, in the time of uh, our parents, there wasn't Google when they were our age. But to summarize, the courts in, in this part of, at least in Singapore, took a very different approach from, this part is a little bit uh, academic. La. Instead of saying that there is, uh, in other countries, like let's say in the UK, you cannot sue unless you step down for, for, you cannot commence a writ of defamation unless you step down from your ministerial position. And this is really within our manifesto. It is one of the points that we call on that we, we put in the manifesto, that a minister should not be able to, in the 2015 uh, manifesto. But the idea is that in other countries, so in Singapore, regularly uh, there, there is dicta from you know, the judgment saying that Singapore does not believe in the press as a fourth estate, and there is no, where else in, in two comparative jurisdictions, at least even in the UK, there is a test of uh, the public interest defense, which is that, in comparing the interests of a politician to, to in comparing the interests of a politician to his own reputation and protection versus the public interest in having a panoply of views be put up, the latter should always be preferred. So guys, let's, let's bring all this reasoning to the POFMA context. At the end of the day, it is for you guys, members of the electorate, to decide if you want a society that believes that politicians should be protected or you should be protected. Do you have the right, given the informational asymmetry, to put forward your view, even if you may not know? For example, and that brings us to another criticism of POFMA, which is that it is one-sided. Only the government can issue it. For example, let's say, let, let's bring this to 
to the only the government can issue it and it relates to another of our demands in the manifesto which is the freedom of information act and all these matters work in tandem to ensure that POFMA should be in essence what i'm trying to say is that POFMA is just the modern day IT ration of the persecutorial tools that were used against persons or who the founder and you know uh, persons who struggled for democracy in their time. But of course, in their time, there wasn't the internet. So you would have to go to a, a go and rent a square and then you have to give a speech. And of course, they may be factually, at the end of the day, it's really about freedom of speech. And whether or not you believe that it is in the com it is in the, the public's interest to allow for people to call out politicians, even if their facts may be wrong because of informational asymmetry. It's just like how I may be wrong on a lot of matters of economics. I also may be wrong on Kenneth may be wrong on legal matters. I would think I would also be wrong on a lot of legal matters because, but the idea is that we want to promote a culture of public discourse. I shouldn't be afraid to interrupt Kenneth. Kenneth shouldn't be afraid to interrupt me. We should be discussing. And I don't see why this cannot be true in the social political context as well. It cannot be, and it relates fundamentally to that elitist kind of concept like we saw in our comment thread. Two persons were arguing and the other person, one of the, the, and the hostile commentators said that uh, I will not, Referred suddenly to use an ad hominem attack to, to refer to the, the uh, nine tech background. So the idea is that, you know, I'm trying to say that POFMA is actually, from a, 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 analytic, a legal analysis point of view, it's actually a very undesirable law because it muzzles critics and it strikes the balance. It is just moving the law in another way from the direction of, for example, you guys can go and uh, Google this, this test, which is um, um, like in other countries, there is this, in, in the case law of uh, Canadian Supreme Court case of Grant and Foster 2009, they decided there is a responsible communication defense in the public interest. And, and that is because, guys, we are all going to be victims of online falsehoods. Earlier today, there was a member of the public that messaged Kenneth who claimed that uh, anonymously to claim that I had been funded by Bangladeshi entities to be a foreign disturbance. You know, and we will receive all sorts of claims and all sorts of falsehoods. And do we then presume to offmar others? No, we don't. And that, and that will conclude my answer, which is that in the legal regime prior to POFMA, there was already a panoply of tools available to suppress critics. And you guys can message me for the article that, uh, I mean, but these are quite boring legal articles. Lah, so if you guys want to please just go ahead. Okay, kind of, uh, anyway, the second uh, question that has come um, in. Sorry, Charles, can I just do some yeah. uh, wrapping up remarks on POSPA? Sure, sure. I was gonna say, I, you know, I, I think your answer, uh, you were quite right about, uh, the government has already so many tools uh, to silence critics, uh, among them the defamation laws, sedition, uh, accusations of offending uh, religious feelings or hurting religious feelings, etc., disturbing harmony. Um, you know, Shan Mugam was talking about a national harmony law. So, why do they need POSMA? And back to my point about. Um, making uh, the government a laughing stock. Uh, the only reason for issuing a POSMA are um, set out in the legislation and they include uh, disturbing the um, national, the, the religious or racial harmony of Singapore, uh, uh, harming our national security, uh, not being a uh, useful catch-all as not being in the public interest or influencing uh, the course of an election. And finally, bringing the government into disrepute. Um, but the government has maintained that Ho Ching is not part of the government. She's, they say she works for a private company and therefore we are, we are under no obligation to tell you how much she's, she earns. 
Yeah. But if she's working for a private company, then how can they use POFMA to protect her? Because it's only supposed to be used for bringing the government into disrepute. Perhaps it's to protect her husband's embarrassment that um, his wife is earning so much and he's concealing it from Singaporeans, pretending that he's only earning a measly two million a year, whereas his wife might be taking home 200 million. So that's yeah. how I, I would conclude on uh, POFMA. Thanks, Charles. Back to you. Yeah. So, uh, guys, I, I mean, I really agree with this part that kind of, and me, and I, I mean, just to touch on a one, two final points for my, for me, is that you see, guys, the culture of silencing and gagging will 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 create this chilling effect, which law students will all know because I mean, law students of whatever school will know that that this chilling effect is one of the themes that are studied in the context of defamation law, but. We, I mean, the, the analysis that is really relevant to our discussion here is that is Ho-Ching's salary a matter of public interest? And the, the second point is, anyway, the judgment is going to be out. You guys can go to Singapore Law Watch. And, and I believe that, uh, you know, the SDB is currently in the midst of an appeal on this substantive uh, matter. So you guys can go to Singapore Law Watch and read up on that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, anyway, uh, Kind of, there is another question that I, I thought that we, we should answer to show that, you know, unlike the PAP, we don't uh, silence critics and we don't shy away from hard questions. The question is from Mr. Jonathan Lai, who has said, Kenneth, you said that we got the government we deserve and you don't want to hear any more complaints. So why are you and your party still up and about? Oh, sorry, you are muted. Kenneth, you have muted yourself. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Jonathan, uh, well, thank you for your question. Um, it's true I said that uh, Singaporeans get the government they deserve. Um, and this was more in reference to the fact that it seems to not be in the economic self-interest as well as uh, a pure economic self-interest, we need a strong opposition in parliament. And uh, we do need, uh, we think that uh, ultimately we can run a better government than the PAP, one that works for all Singaporeans. And um, we, I personally believe, which is why um, I will be, you know, I am a prospective parliamentary candidate in the coming G. I believe that um, we should not uh, give up. Uh, we should continue to fight for the rights of Singaporeans. Thank you. Okay. Um, my, yeah, my, my personal take on this is that, you know, okay, this part is definitely, I, I think in that context, I, since, in fact, this is one of the questions that many of my personal friends have asked me, why do I want to join a party led by an individual who has made that comment? But I think it's really about, about uh, comprehension of the reader and it's not elitist, uh, guys, because please listen. You see, I, I do not understand why there was a lot of negativity to towards uh, that comment, because that comment is basically, uh, could be interpreted as a comment by Kenneth respecting the decision. And even if he had made that comment, I don't see anywhere implicit in that, com in, in that uh, by any reasonable you know, standard of like that, I don't think any reasonable listener would infer that he said he's not going to contest anymore, or that he, he or that he even alludes to this point. But I think, I, the reason why I brought forward this question is because we, we want to show we don't shy away from difficult questions that may be legitimate. And we want to promote a culture of open political discourse. You know, this is not an authoritarian society. And at least, I mean, we don't believe in, in an authoritarian society. And in our discussion format, we don't want to, yeah. So um, there are a number of questions coming in. So... Oh dear, uh, Mr. The technical administrator, uh, it says that there are 
there are some, the video has been freezing and video intermittent telecast, but oh, the, now it says video telecast now better. And in fact, these are from our haters. So thank you guys uh, to Mr. Jess, Chris. I know you, you, you have posted some negative comments, but you, you are now engaging with us. Yeah, so thank you so much. Now the, the stream is back. Kenneth, there's another question. The question, the question is that uh, this question has been, there is a, a series of discussion on our end, the broadcast is okay. Okay, there has been a series of discussion about Taiwan. Taiwan uh, as a country, do you think we should learn from Taiwan and do we want to move in the direction that Taiwan has gone? Uh, a rather lengthy discussion has been going on between a number of uh, uh, viewers uh, leave, left on the comment thread. So can you comment on this? Hi, uh, Charles. I haven't seen uh, the comments by the viewers about uh, Taiwan. What I will say is that I think Taiwan can serve as a democratic model for Singapore because Taiwan demonstrates that it's possible to have both democracy and prosperity. Now for long, for a long time, Lee Kuan Yew uh, always argued that democracy is incompatible with Asian values. He also argued that um, democracy hindered prosperity. And the problem is that uh, what his, um, his words have influenced, I think, Singaporeans to view uh, democracy as something alien, something that um, is inimical to economic progress, and uh, to continue to accept the PAP's um, fabrications that we need a one-party state, that we need to be like China, otherwise Singapore will collapse and our women folk will be maids in other countries. So I think Taiwan compre comprehensively rebuts um, these assertions, um, these ridiculous assertions, because Taiwan has been a democracy for over 20 years now, uh, no, 30 years. Uh, it has had numerous changes of government. It has freedom of speech. Um, and uh, it, all, it does all this while being uh, a few miles offshore uh, from the greatest um, totalitarian state in the world, uh, from China, and facing the threat of invasion, imminent invasion. So if you look at Taiwan, uh, Taiwan has done very well economically. Uh, its prosperity is on a par with Singapore's. If not, um, it's a uh, record on innovation and starting home uh, groomed companies is much better than Singapore's because we have a status philosophy, whereas Taiwan is much more orientated towards free enterprise. Uh, so I think we can regard countries like Taiwan, South Korea, and even our next door neighbor, Malaysia as far more democratic than Singapore and as demonstrating that economic progress, for economic progress, democracy is, own, is not only not harmful, but is essential. Uh, over to you, Charles. Um, okay, uh, guys, I, I, will, I will make a, I mean, a declaration of interest at the outset because the person who who actually precipitated that comment is actually a lady friend of mine who, who uh, you know, she just wanted to express support and I think she clarified what she means. She is trying to say that we need to, to I, I think it may not be appropriate for me to answer uh, further because uh, this is my, my actually a very close lady friend of mine. So we, I, I shall not uh, answer further. However, Kenneth, there is another question from from a member of the public, which is Mr. Kenneth, what do you see in Charles? Do we want to answer this question? I mean, do you feel that you would like to answer this? Yes. Uh, well, I'll say that um, Charles is uh, uh, 
an able young man. Um, you know, we welcome him into a reform party. We think highly of him enough to uh, put him forward as a prospective candidate for becoming GE. And, um, you know, we, we look forward to uh, him um, serving the people of Singapore in whatever capacity they think fit. So I think, thank you, Charles. I'll pass it back to you now. Okay. So uh, guys, at this juncture, we, we want to, to I, I mean, um, I think we will conduct this for about 15 more minutes. What do you think, Kenneth? And we will wait for, there are no more, oh, there is one question that has just come in to our party's uh, other social media channels. Uh, the question, let me read to you, is, it, it's actually more a, a, a question than a statement. I, I mean, it's more a statement than a question, but it, it seems to be phrased in a manner that is asking us to comment on it. Uh, from Mr. Abdul Rahim, Ibni Ops Osman, who made a statement that, that in, the econ in economics, we need the democracy to grow in tandem. Otherwise, you don't see Jack Ma and Alibaba. So with regards to democracy, it's an idea of contest. What's your response to this uh, quote or statement? Sorry, Charles, can you just... Um, Repeat verbatim? Yeah. Yeah, the statement. Yeah, thank you. The, the reason why I, I actually, because we are going to respond to all substantive uh, comments that, that uh, touch on policy matters, you know, we will, that in the course of, as guys, uh, you guys can rewind the video earlier, we, we interacted with uh, critical comments, negative comments, and also, but I think we want to respond to, the quote kind of verbatim is that, in economics, we need democracy to grow in tandem. Otherwise, you don't see Jack Ma, Alibaba. So with regards to democracy, it's an idea of contest. What say you to this? Exactly. Um, yeah, Charles, I think uh, in uh, democracy, in politics, as in economics, competition is essential if we are to get uh, the best outcomes. Just as monopolies generally lead to higher prices and less innovation, uh, a one-party state yeah. means a system in which uh, there's no responsiveness of the government to the people, in which uh, new ideas cannot come forward, um, in which uh, ministers, civil servants, and the general public become yes men or yes women, yes people, afraid to state their views. And the result is uh, generally uh, economic stagnation. Yes. Many people cite um, China as an example of economic success uh, on account of it having a totalitarian government, uh, which um, doesn't allow any opposition. But I would say that its economic progress is almost in spite of its uh, authoritarian system rather than because of it. And for that, you just have to look at how prosperous Taiwan is compared to China. Yes, yes, yes. I fully agree. So uh, can, I, can I share my views? Yeah. Okay. At this juncture, uh, I, I think I've written uh, fairly extensively at least. I want to begin with, I think the quote is a very... Uh, okay, Mr. Madusa, we will reply to you shortly. Okay. Guys, my response is that, number one, economic progress is actually illusory unless the whole, of, uh, the whole of the society moves along with it. And GDP is not, although I do not claim to be trained economics, I used to give, I, I mean, I used to read up about economics. And the best illustration I would give is that if we were to get eight homeless, myself, and a member of the public that actually commented earlier, interacted, and asked a, a question, which we answered, he is a personal a friend of mine, Mr. Chang Liang, who is, and if let's say we were to, to 
the reason why I mentioned him is, of course, we, I cannot share further about his own personal background, but I want to use this uh, point to illustrate the ludicrousness of the Singaporean narrative that is constantly parroted. If his net worth is about 80 million and my net worth is about 200,000, and we were to bring another eight uh, persons of the destitute of Bukit Bato together and, and then say that 8 million 200,000, the, 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 the sum total of the net worth of these persons, whose net worth is probably about $1,000, would, would, the, the, the total of all of us is our total net worth is about uh, 8.2 million. Would this be a fair and accurate statement? And this is what is happening in Singapore today, where opposite the state courts, there is a lot of homeless and destitute who, who are and beggars in Chin Sui, and they are separated by one street to Teluk Aye, where the expats will spend a lot of money on beer, a few hundred dollars, and three to five minutes away. And, and that is why I want to say, at least from an intuitive level, we have to respond to Mr. Abdul Rahim's it means Osman's quote because it is really very, very re relevant, guys. The economic progress is illusory unless there is democracy to ensure that the government distributes the fruits of, of assess to, and that is actually relating to why I came forward to stand for election. As a young man, I had long been influenced by the civil rights and accountability uh, thesis of Mr. Jeratnam. And in fact, I wrote about this extensively. And, and, but as a lawyer, when I actually went out to work and started interacting with a lot of low income persons and offer pro bono services uh, asked by my friend and also assist people on pro or low bono basis, then I started to realize that, that there is a big intersection. Although Mr. Jeratnam in Make It Right for Singapore, and also a collection of speeches of Hansard read. He often spoke about the poor, but not on the basis of, uh, of institutionalized discrimination. And in, in his time, I feel that the government, the, the standard of living for the, the average poor person was at least higher than it is today because of one important fact. In the time of Mr. J. Ratnam, there wasn't a lot of foreigners here. I do not think that, that the average standard of, I, I will ask Kenneth to deliver uh, uh, his views on this after this, because my personal take is that I honestly think the poor of today are much worse off than in the time when our founder clashed with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and you know, uh, was it made, made a name for himself and was elected and was the leader of the opposition and all that. And I think that, the increased number of foreigners has made the life of lower income Singaporeans, particularly minorities, even worse because they have to face discrimination on the basis of race as well. Chinese employers would prefer Chinese. So Kenneth, uh, what, what do you feel about this topic? Well, Charles, uh, the Reform Party is believes we are a liberal party and we don't believe in discrimination against anyone on the basis of race, uh, gender, sexual orientation, uh, nationality, etc., or religion. But uh, our stance is that um, we need, we believe that in immigration, we believe that there are benefits to immigration, but it needs to be managed more carefully. What Singapore, what the PAP have done is to use uh, the foreign worker policy uh, of admitting cheap foreign labor. It's not an immigration policy because these workers have no rights and are he heavily indebted, virtually slave labor and can be, will be returned to their home countries the, in the moment they lose their jobs. These undermine Singaporeans' uh, working wages and working conditions, particularly for the lower income groups, <clears throat> while benefiting primarily the government as the biggest employer and also owners of businesses who are the very wealthy. So um, <clears throat> we would <clears throat> implement a minimum wage of probably around $10 an hour 
which would ensure that <coughs> a uh, foreign workers were adequately remunerated here, but also that uh, Singaporeans uh, would be employed um, because they they, their wages would not be undercut. And secondly, we would also look to raise the bar for the employment paths because what is damaging to Singaporeans is that in comparison to uh, other countries, we have a very low threshold for um, foreign professionals and graduates uh, to come here and work. And um, they are unfairly advantaged because they don't have to do national service. They can come here, often the government provides scholarships to foreign students who come here and then they're allowed to work without doing national service first. And uh, only if they become, decide to become a citizen uh, do they have to do NS. So we would raise the employment, the salary bar for employment pass holders. I think it's currently around $3,500 to $4,000 a month. I think it needs to be at least $5,000 to $6,000 a month. So we think immigration brings benefits. We have an, otherwise we would have an aging workforce. Uh, we would have a diminishing population, but we think it needs to be much more carefully managed. And uh, there are limits. Singapore already has one of the highest population densities in the world. So that's our take on it. Um, back to you. All right. Um, I, I actually would really, uh, you know, echo the views of Kenneth, but I would like to elaborate further. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, um, the, the sad truth is that the government would, there is some degree of intersection between the government's uh, usage of state media to propagate lies and also its desire to, to paint every person who speaks out against immigration or rather, uh, you know, calls for a reduction, uh, who speaks out against excessive immigration. The key word is excessive. To echo the views of, uh, I mean, kind of, or rather to put forward my own, my own thoughts, it, it is that we are not objecting to immigration per se, but we have to be very careful in listening to the PAP's narrative that immigration is always good. Because the first the, the, the first point is that the legitimacy of the nation state in the Westphalian international order is on the basis of protecting its own citizens. If I do not protect my own citizens, my claim to legitimacy has been lost. Secondly, we earlier, even in 2011, I pointed out that, that Intuitively, I, I foresaw, I mean, uh, I saw that the government is actually bringing in a lot of foreigners at, as a very uh, cheap or stopgap measure to, to, to uh, you know, depress the cost of wages so that there would be some sham improvement in the economy. That is how I would articulate it, even though I'm not trained in economics. But again, as I said, I, I mean, the idea is that you know, Singaporeans have to come first. And this is the legitimate duty of the government, just like how it's ever the duty of every husband to protect his wife, or the duty of every father to protect his own child and not, and not uh, we can extrapolate the same duty to the, the government. I mean, I, I would like to hear, you know, persons who criticize, what is the difference between these fundamental moral principles that are enshrined and codified in law, like the, the duty of a husband to protect his wife, the, the, to maintain his wife, the duty of a parent to take care of a child, and all that versus the, the, the duty of the state to protect the individual, the, 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 the citizen, particularly in a country like Singapore, which always put forward the Akong theory, the, the very parochial and, pa I mean, the very paternalistic, not parochial, I use the wrong word, the very paternalistic theory of what is nationhood. 
So if the state is in Singapore's context, is viewed as a father or as a parent that we ought to listen to and, and, and because that is the kind of theory that is promoted in Singapore's context, in, 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 in uh, Singapore's context, it is not the, the theory that is promoted in, in the UK, but it's, it, it is definitely in Singapore's context. So my question for viewers to consider is this, does the government have a duty to put forward, to put Singaporeans first? And if the government has a duty to put Singaporeans first, has the government done enough to put Singaporeans first? And of course, I reject the contention of uh, that it has done enough. I, I definitely reject that contention. Okay. Um, Charles, let me just add some closing remarks on that question. I would say that um, this policy of bringing in this huge foreign workforce is part and parcel of the government's effort to project Singapore globally as a dynamo of uh, economic growth. And they do that by using the um, cheap foreign labor to boost economic growth, along with the tax break for multinationals, um, which result in basically fake or manipulated GDP figures. Our yeah. GDP per capita figure is particularly false. Uh, yeah. It looks as though we are one of the third, second or third richest countries on a GDP per, per capita basis. But actually a lot of that is because of uh, the boost provided by a big foreign workforce without any dependence. If you look at Singapore GDP per hour worked, our performance is mediocre really. It's about um, the level of uh, a country in Southern Europe, like, like uh, Spain or maybe Italy. Um, so, and we are a city, not a country. So the foreign labor uh, the, the policy is to, to fend off criticism, to justify the authoritarian state by saying, look at us, how successful we are. And there's a complete disconnect between that and Singaporeans prosperity. What we at the Reform Party believe in is that uh, economic policy needs to be much more anchored on the welfare of Singaporeans, not on the welfare of a small elite and um, government uh, executives of government linked companies. And um, while foreign multinationals, also foreign multinationals, while foreign multinationals are uh, welcome and uh, are essential to Singapore's prosperity. Um, you know, the, the deliberate use of uh, foreign investment policies to boost their GDP uh, should end. There, there are, uh, kind of, uh, can I just briefly touch on another two points uh, on, on this? Yeah, the, the other two points I wanted to say is that it, it is very regrettable that all the time the government uses the narrative of an immigrant-built society to, to justify the relentless wave of immigration because the key question is really about calibration and how much. And we have to reject, at least from the viewpoint, the moment, I mean, perhaps it is due to my own legal training or the fact that I used to you know, like engage in essay ghostwriting and all that. But I, I actually could see the logical fallacy in the government's argument that Singapore has always been an immigrant-built society. And I, I want to ex share this with other viewers to, for you guys to think what I say makes sense. If we look at the historical, the composition of the so-called migrants in Singapore, the first category of mi migrants uh, in Singapore, of course, the Malays would not be considered migrants at all at all, and then they are indigenous people, and this is codified in Article 153 of the Constitution. But the Chinese in Singapore can be classified into two categories. And the first category is really persons who came in the period of uh, you know, the, the, the Ming Dynasty, and they, they, they came to Singapore. And the second group are persons who immigrated in the context of the Chinese Civil War. And the key point I want to make is that we have to be very slow to, which actually intersects with another question that another point which has been raised by one of the viewers, of course, in rather uncivil language, that they are sticking in enclaves 
to themselves. This is a comment by Mr. Jess Chris. I won't, I won't uh, reproduce the content of uh, what he has said because it is rather uncivil and also, uh, you know, if I were to say it then again, I will suffer attacks from PAPIB to say that I am a, a, a chauvinist and, and I am, a, sorry, I'm a xenophobe. But the, the main point I want to share with you guys is that the immigrants of the past who entered Singapore, rather the immigrants, they are immigrants from their own home country. They were not able to come. If you look at the Chinese Civil War immigrants, they, the majority of them came in in extreme poverty and they, they had no option whatsoever to return to their home country and they then settled in into Singapore. And they are willing, able and willing to assimilate. The key word is assimilate. If there are, the idea is that if the pace is too fast, they, the, there will be enclaves of persons who are, yeah, yeah. So there will be enclaves of persons that they will not assimilate. Charles, yeah. I think we have probably exhausted the subject of- Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. I think we'll pass on probably to the yeah. next. There, there's another question. Okay, uh, at this juncture, I will now invite, uh, read out another question. By We will just take two more questions and then we may want to... I, okay, the question from Mr. Pile to read out verbatim is that Malays were deliberately excluded from NS enlistment into the SAF for a long time under a misconceived perception that Malays as a community could not be trusted with the view that they would naturally, in inverted parentheses, align with their ethnic and religious brethren in Malaysia and Indonesia or experience a conflict of interest. So whilst the post-independent rhetoric called for a uni united and multicultural Singapore, the government found it apt to halt Malay presence in the SAF. So I contend that the Singapore government indulged in Islamophobia about 50 years ago and probably is continuing to do so as far as the SAF is concerned. Does the panel have any comments? Well, uh, Charles, I think um, Lee Kuan Yew's uh, racist views regarding the Malays are well known uh, yeah. to most Singaporeans, but no one mentions it, such as uh, uh, if uh, you had a Malay in charge, sergeant in charge of a machine gun, there's the danger he would turn it on his fellow soldiers yeah, if yeah. he were fighting Malaysia etc etc and would a Malay grandmother uh if, would she share her last grains of rice with you yeah yeah and, and there's so, one more yeah I, I I, anyway uh I think you know that we should start we need to get beyond this um the PAP have always stoked these fears of um a Muslim enemy at the door and um you know, regarding the suspicion, Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, you know, we need to get away from this. Uh, we are all Singaporeans and the Reform Party um, doesn't believe that uh, we need this, um, foster this sense of separate identities. We need to start thinking ourselves as Malays, Chinese, Indians, uh, Chindians, whatever, and we need to start thinking of ourselves as Singaporeans. In fact, we would um, remove the race from the NRIC and um, we would also repeal the Ethnic Integration Act, uh, which stops people living uh, where they want. Um, as regards the uh, military threats, I mean, now we see a much more potent threat from China. Is the government going to turn it around and say, will the Chinese population in Singapore be prepared to defend China, to defend Singapore, should China choose to invade? You know, the argument could be turned, could be used against um, the majority as much as uh, it was used against the Malays in the past. So, that's my uh, take. Let's uh, foster a sense of Singaporean identity. Um, you know, Americans don't think of themselves as uh, um, Polish, Mexican, 
or whatever, they generally think of themselves as Americans. Thank you. All right. Um, to answer this question, I, I mean, first of all, it has been really documented that uh, Lee Kuan Yew was anti-Malay and also anti-Muslim. And in fact, uh, the quotes can be all Google online, but another two quotes other than, than uh, Kenneth's quote, because of course the age gap that, that differentiates, uh, I mean, in his later years, Lee Kuan Yew continued to articulate such quotes. And, and he said as well that, uh, you know, we would be able to succeed much more if uh, there were no Malays in Singapore. That is one quote that struck me. But in any event, uh, you know, we want to say that there is a culture. The difficulty in Singapore is that, you know, the government does not want people to talk about race. And therefore, there is still a lot of racial discrimination, which is subtle. It, it is subtle, but it is, there is a lot of ethnic tension under the ground which, um, I mean, friends of mine will know that I'm definitely not a racist. I, I have friends of all, all uh, uh, ethnicities. But other than that, the idea is that at the end of the day, I think the policies that are enacted, such as, which continue to be true today, and I'm sure they were true in Canada's time, and I want to confirm being uh, about easily about 30 years younger than Canada. I want to say that, that it is still true today, at least to my knowledge, that uh, the majority of Malays are, are put at very low ranks in the SPF and the SCDF. And there is a very small uh, underrepresentation of uh, Malay officers in the, the SAF. And also, Malays are denied from the RSAF totally. That, because I, I know this because I was, I mean, this is something that I will. I don't think it's disputed by the public because I was in the, the Tengai Air Base. Uh, so there is no Malay at all in Tengai Air Base. It's really zero, zero. And, and, and the number of Malays and the idea that Malays are excluded from the Air Force is really, really racist. And this is extremely unacceptable. Yeah. And anyway, we, we, if you guys look at the 2015 manifesto, there is a segment devoted to this where we say that, uh, you know, we have to look at our, at the end of the day, racial discrimination is a mockery and a slap in the face of the Article 153 of the, the uh, uh, Article 153 of the, the Constitution. And it's incompatible with a society that claims that claims uh, meritocracy. And it's also incompatible with a society that claims to be, it's incompatible with the Singapore uh, pledge as well. Because we don't even need to begin. The idea is that, uh, I just want to, to raise a, a, something that has been in social media. I do not know if Kenneth is aware of this, but there was a fracas uh, yesterday about Elfian and Tan Wu Ming and Tan Wu Ming, a PAP MP, stoked the feelings of race and started to say, uh, you know, which was widely condemned by the public and use it as a roundabout manner to attack yes, Pritam uh, Singh. Charles, I, I am aware of it, yeah. yeah. Kenneth, can you uh, then, so, so you, you see guys, the idea is that uh, the PAP has always really been anti-minority and the fact of the matter is that the minorities are, and are justified in saying that, in feeling a grief. And I do not know if uh, at this juncture, you know, I really would like to, I, 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 I'm sure that from my personal experience, the Malays are even below the low income Chinese for sure. And there is a high degree of intersection between poverty lines. I mean, uh, you know, the lines of income strata and also racial lines in Singapore's context. And this is unacceptable. And if the PAP is continue, going to continue to, to treat Malays and Indians as uh, third class citizens, because the Chinese, like myself, we are being discriminated against already uh, by in favor of uh, expats and all that. So then I, I mean, but of course, I'll leave Kenneth to comment further on whether he agrees that there is an intersection between the income strata and also the ethnicity strata. 
Well, I think we've, uh, Charles, thank you. Um, I think we believe in providing, we, we at the Reform Party believe in uh, assisting all uh, lower income Singaporeans and all disadvantaged Singaporeans, regardless of race, uh, ethnicity, nationality, etc. We are all Singaporeans. So, um, yeah, we yeah. Uh, we um, should be race blind and uh, think of ourselves as Singaporeans. Yeah. Okay. Uh, kind of. Thank you so much for your response. Kind of. I think as it is, we we agreed that the segment will be until nine. Uh, the last fifteen minutes we will devote to the last question, which is really a question on the perennial topic the problems of public administration and also the group thing of the scholars. And the question is from one Irfan Shafiq, which I now read out his question verbatim. Well, at the same time, it's been quite clear in many contemporary economies that capitalism has come uncoupled from democracy. Public administration has shifted from administering policy in the interest of the public to administration of the public. Thoughts? I think, Charles, that um, it's difficult. Uh, thanks, Mr. Shafi, for his question. Um, I'm not entirely sure what he's getting at, but I would say that uh, in Singapore, the government is not really run for the benefit of Singaporeans, but it's run for a small elite who then principally PAP ministers from the prime minister downwards and then the MPs. They monopolize most of the top jobs among themselves, their relatives and their spouses, starting with the prime minister appointing his wife to be head of Tomasic on an undisclosed salary. So, uh, you know, what we have is a Singapore run for the benefit of a few and not for uh, Singaporeans in general, um, despite all the talk about inclusivity. So what the Reform Party aims to do is to quite simply reform this system and ensure that the government is run for the benefit of Singaporeans and not for the other way around. Thank you, Charles. I'll pass it back to you. All right. Um, the way I interpreted this question is as a critique of the, the fact that the public administrators are out of touch with the public in general and are not representative of the public. And this relates to a question, a topic that I have written, uh, I mean, or I blocked extensively about through the years, which is the problem of the, the as Kirsten puts it in her post, like, that they are institutions used to groom the elite. And I believe that kind of shared this. The main points to note are that, firstly, in the hierarchy, to touch on what Kenneth said earlier, Kenneth has outlined the first and second tier, broadly speaking, of Singapore society, where the first tier is is, is, but he has, of course, I mean, it will be now my job to explain who are the other tiers of Singapore society, because clearly Singapore society does not purely composite the first tier, which is the senior patties, and the second tier, which is, which is uh, lower, the, the less, lower ranking, uh, you know, MPs, and also cronies, such as uh, the persons who earn a lot of money from building the dorms, and therefore, and therefore, uh, Sedex uh, and and they essentially the crux of the matter is that that uh, they were connected to the grassroots. Below these two tiers, the problem it, it comes out at the end of the day from a culture which was contrary to to viewers who have to understand that. It, all these uh, hierarchical or classification of society is inherent in Lee Kuan Yew's memoirs. The society was built by, was, uh, if you guys go and read Lee Kuan Yew's memoirs, you will immediately 
understand the vision that he outlines of society, which is an extremely tiered and rigid one by nature. He presented, other, after these two tiers, the third tier of, of persons in Singaporean society, will, will, I will later on call on Kenneth to, to share his thoughts. But I want to, the third tier of Singaporean society, broadly speaking, at least as I can discern from uh, Kenneth's writings as well on his blog, is really persons that are foreigner, rich foreigner expats, and also uh, you know scholars. Like a case study would be would be of course the numerous persons groomed out for PAP leadership and part of the the uh, civil service previously, like the Brigadier General in Bishan Topayo, and finally. Uh, corporate big wigs. And the, below them would be a, the tier of society, which is like, for example, the, the, the massive um, influx of lower ranking civil servants that are still part of the gravy train. And they are who, are, who then vote for the PAP out of their own selfish desire to keep the system alive, as well as uh, persons that still are in middle management. These four tiers together would, would make up the better part of the better half of Singaporean society. But below them, we see a lot of uh, displaced Chinese workers who are stuck at, even after 15 years, they are, they are only earning about 2,500 or even less. And there were reported cases of, you know, this uh, Malay man who is, he had to steal copper at night to pay for his wife's surgery. And after working uh, 28 years as a security guard, I believe, he was still earning, earning, only earning about 1,006. And their income progression is stuck. So I present the viewers that, you see, at the end of the day, the reason why the scholars, which I term them, I mean, I, I would put a parenthesis around them or define them as, as, a, as a false scholar because they are not, they are not genuinely, uh, uh, they are not, their scholastic ability is a is not an accurate reflection of their of their electability because they do not have a care for the persons in the lower tier of society. Secondly, it the the thesis of meritocracy and in the public administration is the the, the metric that was used for selecting public administrators is already wrong because firstly. They, were, they, they would choose the person on the basis of conformism, like whether the person is willing, willing to accept the state ideology being these rank, the, the, the various tiers. La. And of course, uh, um, the, the various tiers that I, I previously uh, you know, spoke on. And the second criticism, which Kenneth has written extensively on, to paraphrase his words, are that it is used to promote the elite of the day and the children of the elite of the day and keep it in a constantly going cycle, you know? So guys, at the end of the day, the fifth, if the fifth year of society is persons who are broadly speaking, using our analytical device of an eight tier pyramid, the, the fifth year would be, would be persons that are uh, the, the lower income Chinese stuck in these day end jobs. The sixth year will be minorities apart from the few tokens like Masagos and of course, uh, you know, the unelected president. But, but the idea is that the majority of them have to. So we now bring all the questions, you know, the, the points that we discussed earlier together in the sense that that, uh, that is the sixth tier of society, the minor, the, the, and the seventh tier of society is, who is the seventh tier? It is persons like, like critics of the PAP, single mothers that I have to assist to file the MSS summons, the homeless that, you know, when we tried to do a cardboard event, we were, we were silenced and, and they, they wandered around Bukit Batok, as a, you know, for example, outside West Mall and sleep and, and some of them are incontinent and they have nowhere to go and scavenge the rubbish dumps and they are totally invisible, invisible and the society has, has it is a big, I mean, you guys can go to to Kenneth's blog and to read about all this because I think he presents the matter in a more, on a more regular basis, but I try to write uh, on these matters whenever I'm free. But the, the crux of the matter, my friends, is that mm. seventh tier of Singapore society is largely viewed as economically worthless because they view an individual as, as 
this is a very, uh, you know, I mean, I hesitate to, to, the idea is that at the end of the day, it views men as a, as a mere cop in a wheel. And that is what our founder did not stand for. And if you guys read uh, Make It Right for Singapore, you will immediately see in the speeches that he rejects this hierarchical pyramid. This hierarchical pyramid must fall. It can never be allowed to continue and it has to fall. In the year 2020, it will fall. And of course, I hope it will fall. But if it doesn't fall, then we need to look at ourselves. Do we agree with this tiered classification? And why is it that Mr. Kenner, who should be in the third tier, he's coming forward to speak and all that. And if Mr. Kenner had been willing, you know, connected to the elite and all that, it's likely that, you know, that he would be selected to join the PAB. <laughs> that is, I, I mean, but the idea is that, that, and the final point I wanted to touch on is that really, if you look at the, the greatest irony is that uh, the greatest irony is really that the PAP constantly talks about values of Chinese morality and filial piety and uses this to buttress its, its existence. But because I really studied, you know, like the philosophy of Confucius and the Rutia Sisiang and all that, and of course in English, like, you know, the amongst all the virtues, by the easy or when 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 Filial piety is considered to be chief of the virtues, and there are so many old that are scavenging the rubbish bin, and they are asked to, you know, in fact, a lot of my, my clients who are from foreign nationalities and even uh, my friends who are from foreign, who are foreigners ask me this. They ask me, is Singapore a society that is so immoral that, that the old are made to collect rubbish, to, to work in, 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 uh, as cleaners in hawker centers? And I have no answer to this. You know, because I felt that immediately that was one of the factors that made me realize that the society is becoming extremely immoral and, and it is a society where the classification is becoming more and more stratified and we just have to reject it. Stop. Yeah. So, of course, the, before I, I, bring, I give the floor back to Kenner, I mean, you guys may be probably thinking, who is the eighth tier of the society? The eighth tier is, of course, Bangladeshi workers and maids who were denigrated by the state. I, I, I mean, in the sense that they are invisible altogether and they are the subject of frequent uh, abuses and, and, you know, like, like uh, the maid abuse and they are considered invisible. So broadly speaking, I just want to give the floor to Kenneth to, hear, to ask him if he has any thoughts about, about the the pyramidal hierarchy of Singapore society and the concrete plans that our manifesto has to ameliorate uh, uh, the extremes and to offer some kind of concrete financial assistance for the persons in the lower tier of Singapore society. Kenna, please. Uh, thank you, Charles. Um, as we are approaching the two hour, it's coming up for nine. Um, and we don't have much time left. I'm just going to say, yes, I think um, what you said was very accurate, but uh, the PAP government is still very much uh, influenced and governed by the um, eugenicist and uh, social Darwinist views of uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, in particular, Lee Kuan Yew believed that um, with three education, the elite or those who were intelligent had already risen to the top. And basically, um, there was nothing more really to be done for those at the bottom. And much of that uh, philosophy, I feel, still um, infects the PAP despite their claims to be running Singapore for inclusivity, uh, while they earn multi-million dollar salaries as ministers, while their spouses and relatives occupy top positions in GLCs on millions of dollars in salary, the prime minister's wife on undisclosed remuneration. Um, they, they claim that uh, we cannot afford a welfare state, we cannot afford the most minimum of safety nets, uh, we can't afford uh, 
a more comprehensive medical uh, coverage for our citizens. We can't afford uh, to alleviate old age poverty by helping seniors, by paying them a benefit. Uh, we can't help uh, lower income families with children by paying them. They claim these, but then they hand out vast corporate subsidies and they allocate the best job for themselves. Um, so if you want a different Singapore, if you're very happy with the system, as our founder said, uh, you know, there are plenty of other parties out there. If you want real change in Singapore, support the Reform Party, send us to Parliament. Thank you. So I'll pass it back to you, Charles, to wrap up. Thank you. Yes. So, all right, uh, guys. At this at, at this uh, juncture, I would like to thank all of you for for your contributions, and we will we also apologize to uh, whoever's question was omitted and. You guys can write to info at reform.sg for, for more detailed responses. We'll and, be holding, yeah. Charles, I just wanted to say, yes, we will be holding further sessions. So any questions held over, we can yeah. answer at the next session. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the, the attendance today. Bye-bye. Mr. Technical Administrator, you can shut off the video now. Is the video shut 